in an old book called How Christ Said the First Mass. Father Meager writes that Christ chose the Senegal in which to celebrate the Passover because there lived, died, and were buried Melchizedek, David, Solomon, and all the kings of David's family till the Babylonian captivity. Beginning with Melchizedek then, he is the king of Salem, meaning peace. And Abraham, after offering Isaac on Moriah, named the city Jireh, meaning possession. And that the two great patriarchs disputed about the city's name, but then agreed to unite the two words made meaning or making Jerusalem, the city of peace. Hebrews called it Ariel, lion or hearth of God. And the Grecian Jews said it was Agiapolis, the holy city. When Hadrian destroyed it, the Romans named it Aelia after its first name. It was the holiest all the cities of earth, because of him foretold to come, and there redeem our race. Now Melchizedek lived on Sion, his palace being built on the very spot where Herod built the cenacle, in which Jesus Christ said the first mass. This great prophet, king, priest of the Most High God, bringing forth bread and wine, offered this sacrifice of thanksgiving for the victory God gave Abraham. He offered this bread and wine to God as an image of the Mass, and not for food for Abraham's troops. Well, Melchizedek died and was buried in his fortress on Mount Sion. In the imagery of the Old Testament, Sion was a prototype of the Church with its Eucharistic sacrifice, while Jerusalem was emblematic of heaven. Well, after Melchizedek died, the citadel was captured and occupied by the Jebusites until David and his soldiers scaled the walls and took the city. And King David rebuilt Jerusalem and named it the city of David and abode, abode there all the time of his reign. And David's palace was celebrated. It was built on the very site of Melchizedek's palace. And there David prepared a place for the ark. There, the great mosaic ceremonies were carried out until Solomon built his famous temple on Moriah, another hill a little to the north of east. And from that time, Sion became a sacred place in Hebrew story. There, they celebrated solemn feasts in David's day and called Sion a holy mountain. Well, Solomon enlarged and fortified the old fort built by Melchizedek and David, and there abode the Ark of the Covenant, from the time David placed it in his palace, till Solomon had finished his famous temple on Moriah. Now on the site of Melchizedek's and of David's palace rose Solomon's great palace, which took 13 years to build. It was celebrated for its magnificence and extent. Courtrooms, prisons, halls, all were of fine Judean marble, cedar of Lebanon, and it was burned and totally destroyed by the Babylonians when they captured Jerusalem. But under the palace in the vault next to David's tomb, Solomon and all the kings of Judea were buried. Well, Herod, the Edomian, born of Judah's tribe, last of Hebrew kings, foretold to reign till the Messiah came. Hearing of David's vast treasures hidden in his tomb, before beginning to build his famous temple twenty years before Christ was born, he sought for the treasures David had hid under his palace. And as he had heard that Hyrcanus, who had been king before him, had opened David's sepulchre, and taken out of it three thousand talents of silver, and that there was a much greater number left behind, and indeed enough to suffice for all his wants, and he had a great while, he had for a great while an intention to make this attempt. And at this time he opened that sepulcher by night, and he went into it, and endeavored that it should not be known in the city, but took only his faithful friends with him. And as for any money, he found none, as Hyrcanus had, had 
done, but that furniture of gold and those precious goods that were left there, all these he took away. However, he had a great desire to make a more diligent search and to go farther in, even as far as the bodies of David and Solomon. When two of his guards were slain by a flame that burst out upon those that went in, as the report goes, the report having been made um, or written by Josephus. So he was terribly frightened and went out and built a propitiatory monument on that fright he had been in, and this of white stone at the mouth of the sepulchre, and that also at great expense. And thus over the tombs of the great kings rose the pile of buildings called the Cenacle, banquet hall by the Romans, for there public banquets were held. It was the highest, largest, finest, and holiest room, except the temple, of all places in the sacred city at the time of Christ. It was beautifully furnished with carpets, rugs, tapestries. Its walls were decorated, its furniture most costly as became that building, over the tombs of the sleeping kings resting in the rock rooms beneath. There synagogue services were held, and it was the largest and finest of the 480 synagogues in Jerusalem at the time of Christ. Now we mentioned the dead sleeping beneath Sion. Kings and prophets' relics rested there the night Christ celebrated over them the first Mass. And he said, Do this for a commemoration of me. Now every incident of that night in room, the surroundings, the services, impressed themselves on the apostles' minds. And when they went forth to establish the church among the nations, they said mass over the remains of saints and martyrs. And persecuted in Rome, they offered the sacrifice in the catacombs, and they later placed the relics in altar stones, and thus down the ages that custom has obtained till our day in all the rites and liturgies of Christendom. Well, the Seneca belonged to David's family. The Lord's mother was a princess of the royal family and David's heir. Therefore, Christ, the prince of the house of David, had a right to the building. And there gathered the apostles, disciples, and Christ's followers for the synagogue services on that historic Thursday night. And what would that historic first mass look like? Father Meager narrates it according to the Jewish customs of the time of Christ. He asserts that it would have been a pontifical high mass sung by the Lord, his apostles, and the people taking part in congregational singing. They are about to begin the synagogue prayers in the cenacle, as was the custom at that time. The Lord gave special directions regarding the vestments they were to wear during the Egyptian Passover, and thus you shall eat it, you shall gird your reins, and you shall have shoes on your feet, holding staves in your hands. Now by lapse of time, these developed into the Passover vestments. The Lord was clothed in purple, for he was the prince of David's dynasty. And over this he clothed himself in vestments of a rabbi, while seven apostles vested in sacred Passover robes. And there they stand, and put hands together, eyes on the floor, as become suppliants in the presence of their God and Creator. These were the customary postures of prayer in the time of Christ, as still seen at the beginning of Mass. First, they bow down deeply before the Holy Scrolls in the Ark. And as the celebrant of the Mass bows down in the Mass before the altar, now, according to the temple custom, they recite the versicle in the psalm, the master beginning, and the ministers responding. I will go into the altar of God, to God who giveth joy to my youth. Judge me, O God, and distinguish my cause from the nation that is not holy. Christ beginning, and the apostles responding. And thus they recited the whole psalm. In the liturgy, St. Peter composed at Antioch, still followed by the Maronites, they follow this custom of temple and cenacle, beginning this psalm when entering the sanctuary. 
Well, after the prayers at the foot of the staircase, Christ with his two ministers went up to the ark and kissed the place where the holy scrolls rested. That was a synagogue ceremony, a sign of their love of the law. And this the celebrant of the Mass now does. The Lord takes the censer, he puts incense on the burning coals with blessing, and with an apostle on each side of him, bows deeply down before the holy scrolls of Moses, and the prophets, the Torah and the Heptorah. And first he incenses the Torah in the middle, and then on each side where rest the other sacred books of the Old Testament. And handing the censer to one of the apostles at the right side of the ark, the latter incenses him as the rabbi. Then they go to the middle, bow deeply down before the holy scrolls, and return to the floor of the bema, or sanctuary. Now did Christ hold out his hands with his body forming a cross, as he stretched out his hands when he was crucified? As the celebrant of the Mass holds his hands? The Talmud says they held out their hands this way in temple and synagogue prayers. Well, they go up the steps of the ark and deeply bow down before the law. They open the ark and reverently take out the scrolls of the law. While they read the scriptures in the temple or synagogue, the clergy stood while the congregation sat. And when the Lord and his seven ministers had finished the synagogue services, they sat within the Bema, or sanctuary, as the bishop sits on his throne, surrounded by his ministers during the first part of the Mass. Then the Lord and his ministers rose from their seats, deeply bowed down before the Torah, the law, and marched from the sanctuary to the table in the middle of the cenacle. And following the temple rite, they marched before him according to their dignity, as the clergy still go before the bishop up to the altar, figuring the patriarchs, then the prophets, then the priests and holy men of the ancient world who went before Christ to prepare for his coming in personages, in personage, prophecy, and ceremonials. And this is the reason that in church ceremonials the celebrant comes last, and everyone is in the procession according to rank. Clothed in sacred vestments then, each carrying his staff, they marched to the table as the Lord had commanded them to eat the Passover lamb. First, the five apostles who had acted as his ministers went, and then the seven who had read the seven sections of the law. And lastly, the prince of the house of David, clothed in royal purple, and vestments of cloth of gold, embroidered in white, red, green, and violet, sacred colors of the temple of the Lord. But as the law laid down, not less than ten, nor more than twenty people could form a band to celebrate the Passover, all withdrew and left him alone with his apostles, forming a band of thirteen. And with the great chalice was a silver plate belonging to the set of Melchizedek, used when he offered bread and wine. This patten held three cakes of unfermented bread, the chalice and patten were covered with napkins, as the sacred vessels are covered on our altars. Now the Gospels give only words and incidents which did not belong to the Passover. The Lord's words, the washing of the feet, the prophecy of Judas's treason, the consecration of bread and the immolation of the wine, the communion, the words of warning, the promise to pray for Peter against the de demon's wiles. These did not belong to the Jewish feast, and they are given in the Gospels. All of these other details are taken for granted because they are part of the synagogue service that precedes the holy meal of the Last Supper, which was a sacrifice and an immolation separating the blood from the body of our Lord sacramentally. And that sets the stage then for the first Mass, and the Mass we are about to, to continue here at the altar. And it also sets the stage for tomorrow, the separation of the Lord's blood from his body on the cross, which is happening once and for all 
and not repeated, but made present again here in these mysterious and sacred ceremonies. That what you see as a supper is the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. And in a mysterious way, it looks like the Last Supper. And it is a repeat of the Last Supper. But the Last Supper is ahead of time. The death on the cross, the crucifixion of our Lord, His death, His burial, and His resurrection. And that we will continue tomorrow. And my poetry is a filigree, it's great to Sancti. Amen.